Welcome back, guys. This lecture is going to be on electron configurations and how to draw or represent orbital diagrams when we're dealing with atoms. So this, um, sometimes it falls under different headings. We're going to keep this in the chapter of periodic trends because you really need to understand how atoms uh, are configured with their electrons before you can start understanding the periodic trends along the periodic table. And some of those periodic trends will include atomic radius, uh, electron affinity, and things like that. But we'll get to that in a separate lecture. So for right now, uh, we're going to get started on the electron configuration and the orbital diagrams. And we'll start with orbital diagrams. Now, before we get too far into this, I just wanted to give everybody a brief reminder. If you've been with me this far in the course, you should know your basic orbital areas. But we're going to go over it just to make sure. And I'm going to use a different colored pen here. So the red circle here encompasses the s orbital. So when we look at the periodic table, we break down all of the elements into different sections. And the different sections correlate to different orbitals that can hold electrons. So the s orbital is the simplest orbital. Um, it can only hold two electrons. And then the next one that we go to, which will be in this blue color, is the p orbitals. Notice that I am excluding helium from these p orbitals, because helium is really part of the 1s orbital. Uh, but the rest of the noble gases would fall into the p orbitals here which we are representing with the blue. So the next one, hopefully you guys know, which we'll represent with the green here, are the d orbitals. And those are primarily your transition metals that are going to be found along here. That's where you would find your d orbital electrons. And then finally, which we don't use quite as often, which we'll represent with the orange down here, are the f orbitals. And those get quite complex. They can hold up to 14 electrons. And the D can hold 10. The P can hold 6. Um, so if you look, uh, the S orbitals, there's only a option as you go across each row for 2 until you fill up the S. So sodium and magnesium, lithium and beryllium. Then you go over to the P and you have 6. So for instance, look at that top row. You have boron, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, and neon. And you're increasing by one electron each time that you go over to one of those elements. The d orbital, likewise, you have 10 electrons that you would fill up. And the f orbital has 14. Now, it's also important to note the d orbitals are a level behind the s and the p orbitals when we start doing configuration. So when I get to level 4s, which is potassium and calcium, the three d orbitals are actually slightly higher in energy than the 4s orbitals. Now, this gets confusing because when the orbitals are empty, the d orbital, the 3d orbital, is higher in energy than the empty 4s orbital. Once we fill the 4s and we fill the 3d orbital, they switch energy levels, which means if I'm going to start removing electrons and creating ions, I would remove electrons from the 4s orbital first. So that's kind of counterintuitive, because we're filling up the 4s before the 3d, which would imply that the 4s is lower in energy, which it is. But then once we start piling those electrons into the 3d orbital, the 3d orbital ends up becoming stabilized, and the 4s jumps up higher in energy. And so we, once they're filled, we would remove electrons from the 4s orbital before we try to remove any electrons from the 3d orbital. So that's an important side note when you're trying to deal with um, electron configuration. So let's talk about orbital diagrams. Orbital, di uh, orbital diagrams are box-like structures, and they represent the given orbitals that would be found in an atom. Um, and these are going to be filled with electrons. Each orbital can be filled with two electrons. Um, and then, well, I should say each suborbital can be filled with two electrons. Um, so the p orbitals can have a total of six, like we were just talking about, d with 10. But we always are going to start filling from the n equals 1. So hopefully you guys remember n, that's your quantum levels, your principal quantum numbers from beforehand. So n equals 1, uh, that's where we're going to start filling, and we'll work our way up through the energy levels as we fill. So I'm going to bring the periodic table back up here. And let's go back to our black ink. 
And I'm going to start with some of the simple examples. So let's do hydrogen, helium, lithium, and then I also want to grab nitrogen, and you'll see why in a moment, because there's another example that I want to run with the orbital diagrams. So let's start with these, hydrogen, helium, lithium, and then we're eventually going to hit nitrogen. So here are the orbital diagrams for hydrogen, helium, and lithium. And if you'll notice, those little half arrows, they represent an electron. Now, it's conventional, if you're only going to have one electron in an orbital, that you put it as a spin up or a plus one half. So remember from quantum, the m sub s is the spin. You can have plus one half or you can have minus one half. The plus one half would be the up electron. The minus one half would be the down electron. And that's talking about the spin of the electrons themselves. So it is not true that you always find a plus one half if it's isolated in an orbital. It's actually a statistical probability that you'll find half of your hydrogens with a plus half spin, and half of their half of the hydrogens would have a minus one half spin. Um, but we typically, when we're writing it out as chemists, we always, by convention, just do the plus one half. Um, if you put a minus one half, that would not be wrong in any way. So you notice hydrogen, if we go back to the periodic table, hydrogen has one electron. Helium has two electrons. Lithium has three electrons. Now, as we go through, here's level one, here's level two, here's level three. These are the principal quantum numbers, level four. So if we come back here, hydrogen would be in the 1s orbital, and it only has one electron that is occupying that 1s orbital. And then we said helium has two electrons. So helium is still in the 1s orbital, but now I have two electrons, and so when I pair them, I make sure that I put the opposite minus one-half spin, and I pair them together. And then you can see lithium has two 1s electrons, and then once I break into the 2s shell, I give it one electron. And if I were to do beryllium, I would fill up that 2s shell completely. And if I wanted to move to boron, I would introduce a 2p shell. So we're going to get some practice with this later on. But this brings up some important points when we're doing electron configuration. Um, so let's look at those. Uh, the Akubau principle, which is German for um, to fill up or to rise up in energy, okay, is what we're talking about. We're going to fill the orbitals from low energy to high energy. So what does this mean? Well, the 1s orbital is lower in energy than the 2s orbital, and the 2s orbital is lower in energy than the 2p orbital, et cetera, as you're climbing. So the 3s is higher in energy than the 2p orbital would be. So as we fill, you don't really see this until you get to lithium, but once we're at lithium, we have 1s, and we have 2s. And if you notice, the 1s has both of the electrons in it before I start filling any electrons in the 2s. So it would not be correct to put that unpaired electron into the 1s orbital and then turn around and put the paired electrons in the 2s orbital. We would always fill the electrons in the most stable orbital first, energetically speaking, and then we'll move our way up if we have additional electrons that we want to deposit into other orbitals. So that's the uh, Afubau principle. Then we also have something called the Pauli exclusion principle. And this one's also important because it tells us that there's only two electrons allowed per orbital. So notice that when we get to helium or when we get to lithium, we're not putting more than two electrons in any given orbital. So that 1s, once we have two electrons in that, we move over to the 2s. We can't start cramming more electrons into that 1s orbital. Now, as you get the p and the d orbitals, you're going to get several suborbitals that can fill up and hold multiple electrons. But each individual suborbital can still only hold two electrons at a time. And the other thing with the Pauli exclusion principle is that it's not just two electrons per orbital, but they are only allowed with opposite spins. And I have a bit of a typo there, so ignore that c. That should be a space. Okay? The orbitals should always be filled with two electrons, and they should have opposite spins. So we should never see two positive spins. You should not have anything in an orbital that looks like this. That would be incorrect. Same thing, you can't have two negative spins. You should always, when you fill out an orbital, have the plus and the minus one-half spin, just like that. So I wanted to bring in nitrogen, 
So here's a look at nitrogen. If we go back and we look at nitrogen, so let's go back to the periodic table. Nitrogen is found right here in the P-shell. And if we look at the number of electrons in the P-shell, we have one electron in the P-shell with boron, two electrons in the P-shell with carbon, three total electrons in the P-shell, but seven electrons total for nitrogen when we look at nitrogen. So let's bring nitrogen back up. We have 1s, 2s, and then 2p. And we go along and we start filling up. So we say 1s, let me fill two electrons in there. Remember, it's got to be a total of seven. So here's two electrons. And then I say I'm going to go to 2s, two more electrons. Notice their spins are paired. And then when I get to 2p, I have a total of three electrons here. So the total equals seven. If I do my two plus two plus three, that's a total of seven electrons. Now notice in the 2p orbital, when I fill it, I fill each one individually before pairing. And that's known as Hund's rule. So as electrons start to fill orbitals up with more than one suborbital, which we refer to as degenerate orbitals, they're equal in energy. That means each one of those p's are equal in energy, the three blocks up there. The electrons must be distributed equally before we start pairing them. And that has to do with the stability of pairing electrons. So electrons are negatively charged. When I start pairing them, they're going to have some repulsion from one another. And that's not a stable situation. So what we want to do is we want to try to fill these orbitals up with one electron in each. And then if I have extra electrons, I can go ahead and I can start pairing them up if I need to. So again, this is uh, orbital diagrams, and we will go ahead and practice some orbital diagrams uh, when we get to the end of this lecture. So the next thing we're going to do is we're going to move to writing out electron configurations. So these go hand in hand with orbital diagrams, um, but I would say they're probably a little more simplistic than orbital diagrams when you have to draw out all the orbitals. So electron configuration um, is really when you're writing out orbitals uh, as they would be sequentially filled by denoting the electrons found in a given superscript value. Um, so again, a superscript is that little number that would come above any type of other letter or number. Um, so let's take a look at some examples. So I'm going to bring the periodic table back up here. And for this, let's do hydrogen, helium. So we'll bring those guys back in. We'll do lithium. We will do carbon. And then let's say, let's get aluminum so we can start getting a little further down on the chart with our examples. So we will go ahead and we'll try those out. So for hydrogen, if I want to write out the electron configuration for hydrogen, I first need to consider where hydrogen is going to stop. And that's not too hard because hydrogen, we already said, is found in the 1s shell. So I'm going to start with 1s, and that's where I'm going to end. And how many electrons does hydrogen have? It has one electron found in the 1s shell. So we would say 1s1. And that's that superscript up there. So that rep that's the electron configuration. It's representing uh, where I can find my electrons for that hydrogen. So this is pretty simple, but let's do helium. Helium is also in the 1s shell. But now it's 1s2, because I can find two electrons occupying that 1s orbital for helium. So then we said, let's look at lithium. So lithium, let's go back here. Again, 1s for hydrogen and helium. Then we break into 2s with the lithium. So for lithium, I'm going to have 1s2. But then the next shell is 2s. And then I need to put the next value up there, which is going to be 1, 2s1. OK? So the next one that we said we were going to look at is carbon, and then we'll do aluminum. So carbon is going to be 1s2, 2s2. And then if you look at a periodic table, you're going to see that it's two electrons into the p orbital. So we would have 2p2. And that would be the electron configuration for carbon. So let's do aluminum. Aluminum, we start again at the 1s level, 1s2, then we have 2s2, then we have 2p with 6, because we can hold 6 electrons in the 2p orbital, 
And then the next one we're going to have is 3s2. And then 5s2. And then 3p1. So that would be for aluminum. Because if we go and we look, aluminum would have only that one electron in the p orbital. It's the first in the 3p row. All right, so now we're going to talk about the noble gas notation, all right? And the noble gas notation is, it's actually nice. It's a simpler way of representing an electron configuration. And the, the method by which it becomes simpler is that we're going to represent all of the core non-valence electrons as the noble gas that comes before the, the quantum number that we're in. So that's going to represent all the core electrons. So for instance, let's say that I wanted to do, um, we said carbon, right? So carbon, instead of doing the 1s, I would write helium, because helium is the noble gas. So this is if I wanted to do carbon. And then I would say 2s2, I would start with row 2, because helium is summing up row 1. And then I would say 2p2 when I do that. All right, so let's bring some examples here. Uh, we just did carbon, so let's do that one one more time. Carbon would be helium. And it's probably good to have a periodic table while you're doing this so that you can look at it and reference what I'm talking about. Helium, 2s2, and then 2p2. So the helium encompasses that 1s level. Okay, but 1s2 isn't that bad to write out. So let's do aluminum, which we just talked about. So aluminum was getting a bit longer. With aluminum, the noble gas that comes before aluminum is neon. So we would write neon. That allows us to cut out the 1s and the 2s configuration, and we'd go straight for 3s2, and then we could say 3p1. So the further down the chart you go, the more handy this becomes, because it lets you cut out a lot of excess writing. So let's take something else. Let's take calcium, for example. So if you go onto the periodic table and you look, the noble gas that comes before calcium is argon. So we would put that in brackets. And then calcium starts in the quantum level of 4. So we would say 4... And then if you look at calcium on the periodic table, it's in the second position of the S shell, so it would be 4S2. All right, so let's do some practice, because we have been talking about this. Let's do some orbital diagram practice, and let's also do some electron configuration practice. So to start, let's do electron configurations. We're going to do the noble gas configurations as well as the full electron configuration for these atoms, or I'm bringing in the option here of doing an ion, because remember with ions, we're either adding electrons or taking electrons away. So let's keep that in mind while we work through this. So for iron, iron's going to be a pretty long one because we're up in the transition metals. We would start with 1s2. And then we would go to 2s2. Hopefully you have a periodic table and you're following this with me. 2p6, that delivers us up through neon. And then we need 3s2. Next one could be 3p6. All right, so we're up to argon. 4s2, up to calcium. And now we start heading into the 3d shell. And if you look at that first row of transition metals and you count, one, two, three, four, five, six in is where we find iron. So we would have 3D6 in this case. So that would be the electron configuration. If I wanted the noble gas, the last noble gas before I headed into iron's 3D shell was argon. So I would simply write AR in brackets. And then I would get to pick up at 4s2, and I would also include my 3d6. And that's how I would write out both of those configurations for iron. So let's take a look at potassium. For potassium, I'd be 1s2. I'm going to assume you guys have a periodic table 
while you're working through this so you can follow along. 2s2. Then I'm going to head over to 2p6. Next, 3s2. Then I'm going to have a 3p6. All right, so I'm at argon again. And then I come down to 4s and I stop at 1 because potassium is in the quantum level 4 and I only go one electron in and there I am at potassium. So again, I would have argon as the previous noble gas and then this one would just be 4s1 that comes after the argon. So let's do the sulfur anion, sulfur 2 minus. Um, we would start at 1s2 and then we would go to 2s2 and then we would head to 2p6. We're one row above sulfur there. The oxygen is sulfur's neighbor right above it. And then we would go to 3s2. And here we go. We're headed into the 3p where sulfur is. Now, sulfur would normally be 3p4, but I'm saying I have two additional electrons with that 2 minus. So I go from 3p4 to 3p5 and finally to 3p6. And that makes sense because that is the same configuration as argon. And that's what sulfur is striving to do. To, it's, it wants to become or mimic a noble gas for stability. So how would I write this in terms of the noble gas configuration? Well, it's not just argon in brackets because argon comes after sulfur. So technically, sulfur came before argon. So we put neon in brackets. And then we would say 3s2, and we would go 3p6. So hopefully those examples made sense to you. Let's take a look at the orbital diagrams. Um, because some of these orbital diagrams are going to have relatively limited space, um, I have worked them out, and we'll take a look at them in a moment here. So you're going to provide the orbital diagram for the following atoms or ions. Chlorine titanium, which is a transition metal in the 3D shell, and magnesium 2 plus. So we're going into the 2 plus state, which this time means we've lost two electrons from what magnesium's normal electronic neutral state would be. So take a minute, pause the video and work through these, and then we'll come back. All right, so hopefully you were able to figure this out. I'm going to bring it up here. If we look at chlorine, Chlorine is in the 3P shell, so I drew all of these out. We start with 1S, fill it up, 2S, fill that up, 2P, that gets completely filled, 3S, and then chlorine's found in the 3P shell. I would need to fill each of these individually first, so I'm going to draw this up here. The way that I would fill this out sequentially is that I would have to say, here's 3P1, here's 3P2, here's 3P3, then I can start pairing 3p4 and then 3p5. Uh, and so you can see there's five electrons in that 3p orbital, and that leads to chlorine. So titanium, we go 1s, 2s, 2p, 3s, 3p, 4s. We're still filling all the way up through each of these orbital diagrams. And then when we get to 3d, titanium is only two electrons into the d orbital. And so therefore, you can see, I don't pair these up. Remember Hund's rule. I have to fill them each individually before I can pair. You can see the five orbitals, and I have two unpaired electrons leading to titanium. So finally, magnesium 2 plus. I normally, for magnesium, would go up and fill up my 3s, and it would be 3s2 with two electrons in it. Because I've lost two electrons, I take them from the highest energy orbital, and that leaves a empty 3s shell. So that should conclude electron configuration and orbital diagrams. As always, if you guys have any questions, I encourage you to go ahead and leave them in the comments section below. Um, or you can shoot me an email. Thank you very much for watching, and as always, please remember to like the video if it helped. Comment if you have any uh, critiques or suggestions or just to say that you like the video. And subscribing is always appreciated, and it is the best way to get up-to-date uh, videos when they're released. So thanks a lot, guys, and I will see you for the next lesson with Periodic Trends.